Hello, welcome to this Bible teaching from First Baptist Church in Cameron, Missouri. My name is Terry Beasley, I'm the music pastor here. And for the last several weeks I have been doing a Bible study from the Bible Studies for Life curriculum, which is one of the curriculums that some of our Sunday school classes use here at First Baptist Church. And uh, specifically for the last three weeks, we're now in week four of a unit entitled Dealing with Messy Relationships. And today we will be focusing on the idea of serving. Uh, we'll be turning to Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 through 15, and Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, and verse 10. So regardless of whether you have been using this specific uh, quarterly or not, I, I believe that you will get something from this morning's lesson. If you've not had the opportunity to watch the previous lessons from this unit on um, loving and encouraging and forgiving, I encourage you to do that. I, I think all these things, uh, there are six traits that we'll be looking at, all these things uh, working together will help us maintain healthy relationships and know how to deal with messy relationships. So previously in this unit, uh, we've been talking about the six traits that God has called us to exhibit to either clean up a relationship that is messy or preferably to maintain a relationship that is healthy. Uh, in the first lesson of this unit, we talked about love. Uh, specifically, we looked at the truth that we should let love permeate every relationship. Not just some relationships, but we are to love everyone. And we know that in dealing with people, that some people just seem more lovable. In some situations, it's easy to love. And in other situations, it may be more difficult. But we are told that we are to let love permeate every relationship. And we, we're to be mindful that love is sacrifice. Love isn't just an emotion. It's not something that we just feel within our heart. But it's a choice. It's an action which often requires for us to sacrifice on the behalf of someone else. In the next week's lesson, we looked at the trait of being an encourager. Uh, and uh, the truth in that lesson was that encouragement strengthens relationships. We saw this in the example uh, from the book of Acts, the example of Barnabas and Saul. And as, as we think about encouragement, I'd, I'd like you to th just think about this question. When was the last time that you offered words of encouragement to someone. Maybe it was uh, words of encouragement to your spouse, to a child, to a parent, to a sibling, to a co-worker, to a boss, to a neighbor. The, the truth is that, that too often we are quick to criticize. We're quick to criticize. And we may, but may we be even quicker to encourage. So though we are often quick to criticize, may we be even quicker to encourage. Last week, we looked at the third trait, which was that of forgiveness. And the truth was that relationships grow deeper with forgiveness. May the forgiveness that we offer have no limits just as God's forgiveness toward us is also limitless. And so today, week four of this unit, we will be looking at the trait of serve, serving others. We'll be looking at Paul's letter to the Galatians in chapter five, and then also in several verses in chapter six. If we look at the, uh, the beginning verses of Galatians, we see in Galatians 1-2, that actually Paul indicates that this letter was written to the churches of Galatia, uh, plural. As you can see from this map, Galatia was a region, a Roman province. Paul traveled through this area on each of his three missionary journeys, likely uh, starting, founding several churches on his first missionary journey through this region. So in today's study, we're going to see Paul's encouragement to these believers that they are to seize the opportunity to serve. Let's open with a word of prayer. Our Father, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for forgiving us. We thank you for encouraging us through the work of your Spirit. And we pray that you would just continue to develop those same traits in us. And today, as we talk about 
being servants. May we see uh, the words of encouragement from your word to us that we would serve others and that we would serve in such a way that would bring honor and glory to you. I pray that in these few moments that you would be our teacher. It's in your son's precious name we pray. Amen. So as we begin, let me begin uh, by asking you a question. When have you received stellar service? You might think about a time when you went to a restaurant. Although, I don't know about you, but it's now it's been several weeks since I've actually been in a restaurant and sat down for them to serve me because of COVID-19 and how, that's, uh, how we've had to respond to that. But, but if you think about having good service at a restaurant, you know that the meal was well prepared and, and your, your waiter or your waitress just did a great job of getting you everything that you needed and, and checking to make sure your drinks were refilled and, and, and it was just a great experience. How, how grateful we are for that kind of service. And we show that many times when we visit a restaurant by the way that we tip that person that is serving us. Maybe you think about a time that you've taken your car into a, into a repair shop and how they just went above and beyond to make sure that you understood what was happening with your vehicle. That they weren't just trying to sell you something that you didn't need, but, but they took time to explain what was happening and, and, and how not addressing the situation might cause further problems. And, and so maybe you were very appreciative of the great service that you got there. We think about it when we go to a doctor's office. And of course, many times when we go to the doctor's office, we're sick. And so we're that much more grateful to have someone be able to diagnose what's going on within our body and to give us a prescription so that we can start to feel better. Or maybe you think about the, the service that you receive at a grocery store or at a department store, that, that salesperson that helps you find what it is that you're looking for, that, that grocery store that goes really above and beyond and makes sure that they have items on, on the shelves that you need. You know, good customer service is not just about making a sale or even keeping a customer, but it's about doing what is right and helping the other person. Well, we strengthen our relationships when we help and serve other people. Serving is a tangible way to show love towards others. And so as we go into the scripture this morning, we, uh, we begin with Galatians chapter 5, and we're going to be looking at verses 13 through 15. So you, I invite you to open your Bible with me. Uh, I'm going to be reading from the New American Standard Version, which is also what you'll see on the screen behind me. So we begin, begin in Galatians 5, 13 through 15. For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care lest you be consumed by one another. Galatians 5, 13-15. So in these few verses, I want us to focus on two words, freedom and focus. Freedom and focus. We, brothers and sisters, as Christ followers, are called to be free. But free from what? Well, we can find part of the answer to that question in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, where it says, Let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. We are to be free from the sin that entangles us. Because of Jesus' perfect sacrifice, the power of sin has been broken, and we can be free from that downward spiral of sin. But within this freedom, we are challenged not to use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. We see that phrase in verse 13. In most of Paul's writings, the flesh denotes the sinful nature. The person who lives according to the flesh is living a life which is contrary and opposed to God. So as Christ followers, we are told that we are to forsake the flesh. We are also called 
to change our focus. We recognize that sin is exhibited by an inward focus. Sin is being selfish. Everything is about us. It's about our desires, our wants, our, our yearnings, our, our rights, our freedom. But service is exhibited by an outward focus. Service is demonstrated in, in being selfless rather than selfish. Thinking about others rather than thinking about ourselves. And so we are told that we need to change our focus. We need to change our focus from being sinful and being self-centered to being servant-minded and being others-centered. When we focus inwardly on ourselves, sins like selfishness, greed, and uncaring attitudes quickly follow and will sour our relationships. The only remedy for living in the flesh is an ongoing relationship with Christ. That is so important. We recognize that even as Christ followers, we still stumble into sin. We still wrestle with that fleshly nature. And so the only remedy is an ongoing relationship with Christ. We read Paul's words in Romans chapter 7, verse 25. So then, on the one hand, I myself, with my mind, am serving the law of God. But on the other, with my flesh... The law of sin. So Paul was saying that, you know, in his mind he knows what's right. And, and he's trying, he wants to do that which is right. But, but on the other hand, his flesh is still tied to that sin. Receiving the Spirit, the Holy Spirit in conversion, never rids a Christian of the flesh. That is, that, that fallen human nature. Instead, he finds, he, he finds the flesh continually warring against the Spirit, and it frustrates his desire to do what God wants. So victory can come only as believers keep in step with the Spirit. The believer must learn to let the Spirit direct and control his life. We must recognize our liberty in Christ by loving people through service. So consider for a moment the ways that you serve yourself. I mean, think about it. When, when we're hungry, what do we do? Well, we find something to eat. When we're tired, we take a nap. We go to bed. When, when we have the need for physical exercise, we, we, we go for a walk. We, we go for a run. You know, we, we naturally serve ourselves, but Paul challenges us to serve others just as faithfully as we serve ourselves. So consider this question. Have you seen relationships strengthened through acts of service? Have you seen a relationship that you know has been strengthened because of serving? What I'd like you to do, if, if you're watching this uh, teaching with someone, you're invited just to, to put the teaching on pause and, and discuss that question together. Share your stories, and then come back, and we'll unpack it together. Have you seen relationships strengthened through acts of service? So as you consider that question, have you seen relationships strengthened through acts of service, Think about these different relationships that can be strengthened. Think, uh, think first about how, how you serve your spouse. You know, one of the things I learned in, in marriage in the first year was that by nature I was very selfish. And I would rather be served than serve. And yet we recognize that, that in order to have a healthy relationship within our family, that we need to consider how we serve our spouse. Do we put their needs their desires, their wants above our own. You might also consider, well, how have you served a, maybe you've served a neighbor, 
You know, maybe there's a neighbor that you were able to provide assistance for. Maybe they were going through a, a difficult time and, and you were able to help meet a need. But consider how you can serve a neighbor, how you can be a good neighbor to those that live closest to you. Consider how you serve within a community of believers. We'll talk about this more as we get into uh, chapter 6, verse 10. But, but thinking about how we serve within the church and how important that service is. So we find that God places us in relationships where we have opportunities to serve. We have opportunities to serve within our own home. We have opportunities to serve in the place that we work or the school that we attend. We have opportunities to serve in the neighborhood in which we live, the community. And we have opportunities to serve in the church that we go to. There's this uh, quote attributed to John Wesley. It's referred to as John Wesley's rule. Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, and as long as you can. That is a great rule to live by. And if we will find ways to do good in all those places, at all those times, in all those ways, we'll see that we have become a servant to others. So as a Christ follower, not only do we have freedom, we have freedom from sin. We have focus. As we place that focus, we give our attention to others. But we're also told that we are to correct and to carry to correct and to carry. And so we turn to Galatians now, chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, and we'll read verses 1 through 5. Brethren, even if a man is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear with one another's burdens, and thus fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone, and not in regard to another. For each one shall bear his own load. Galatians 6, verses 1 through 5. So this chapter... Uh, 6 begins with specific instructions as to how a believer is to confront a brother or sister in Christ who has been overtaken by any wrongdoing. This is speaking of continual rebellious sin, living in that fleshly nature rather than living in godly righteousness. Notice that the goal in the confrontation of sin is always restoration. It says, restore such a person with a gentle spirit. We are warned also in this passage that we are to be watchful, that we are to be cognizant of our own sin and our attitude as we address the sin of a brother or sister. As Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 7, verses 3 through 5, he said, and why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye but do not notice the log that is in your own eye. Or how can you say to your brother, well, let me take that speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye. You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Matthew 7, verses 3 through 5. So you notice in that passage, and I've heard people say, based on that passage, that we shouldn't be taking the speck out of a brother's eye. That we should not be correcting. We should, because that, that's judgmental. And yet that's not what that passage teaches. It's, it's telling us that we need to first look at ourselves before we look at others. And as we look at ourselves, as he says, as, as, a, as an exaggerated example in this passage, you may recognize as you look at your own life that you have a log in your eye. So who are you to be talking to a brother about a speck when you have a log? So he didn't say, leave your brother alone. Don't worry about the speck. But instead he said, first, 
Take the log out of your eye, and then you will be able to see clearly to help take the speck out of your brother's eye. So we recognize that we serve others as we confront them in love. We serve others by confronting them in love. So why is a gentle spirit important in the process of restoration? If we recognize that that confrontation is for the purpose of restoring a brother or sister in Christ, why is it important that we have a gentle spirit? Well, if you would, again, just put me on pause for a moment. I'd discuss that with whoever you may be watching this video teaching with, and then come back and we'll share some thoughts together. So why is a gentle spirit important in the process of restoration? Well, here's my first thought. A person is more likely to respond to gentle correction as opposed to harsh or abusive correction. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 4.21, What do you desire? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love and a spirit of gentleness? Well, that, that's kind of a silly question. I mean, how, how, would, how would anybody respond to that? Well, which would you prefer? For me to come to you with a rod to, to, to beat you or with love and a gentle spirit? So we have to recognize that that gentle spirit is necessary for restoration because it's, it's more likely that a person is going to respond positively to that kind of correction. Secondly, we must be mindful to correct as we would wish to be corrected. Again, we recognize that, that we, may have, we may have a log in our own eye. We may have a speck in our eye. And so not only do we see sometimes the need to correct someone else, but, but we must recognize that we, we sometimes need to be corrected as well. And so we must correct others as we would wish to be corrected. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, Therefore, however you want people to treat you, so treat them. A third thought, gentleness is a fruit of the Spirit, which should always be seen in the life of a Christian. Galatians 5, verses 22 and 20, 23, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so when we think about why is it important for us to, to exhibit that spirit of gentleness when we deal with uh, restoring someone, well, we recognize that it's, it's more likely that we're going to get a positive response if we have that right attitude. That we should do it because that's the way we would want to be treated. And that we should demonstrate that fruit in all of life's situations. One of the most important roles that you play in others' lives is to help them see their blind spots. To help others see their blind spots. But at the same time, we have to be mindful that that you and I, we, we have blind spots too. You know, I, I think about that side mirror on my car, and, and as I work with one of my sons and, and him learning to drive, you know, sometimes I remind him, you know, make sure you check your mirrors, and, and especially as you're thinking about pulling into that left lane to pass that slower vehicle that's in front of you, you need to make sure you check your mirrors, especially that side mirror, because there's a blind spot. And, and, and I know until recently, many times, we, we'd have to kind of take that peek over our shoulder to make sure that a car hadn't gotten in that blind spot where we don't pick them up in our mirrors. But I noticed with a, a recent car that we purchased for my wife that, that on the mirror, it actually shows you uh, with, a, with a, a, a symbol that lights up as someone is in your blind spot. And I thought, what a great invention. You know, that the mirror is warning you, hey, you've got something in your blind spot. And that's the way we are to be. As Christ followers, as loving brothers and sisters in Christ, we are to be mindful of our blind spots and also to, to be that mirror to someone else to help them see their blind spots as well. So not only are we to lovingly and gently correct, but we are also 
told in this passage that we are to carry. You see in chapter 6, verse 2, the phrase, bear one another's burdens. Bear one another's burdens. Strong relationships call for us to help carry loads. Do you enjoy having to move something by yourself? You know, there are many things in life, many burdens that can begin to, to weigh us down. Maybe you're, you're, maybe you're feeling some of these pressures right now. I think especially amidst this uh, coronavirus and, and how it's impacted our families, how it's impacted our schools, our, our businesses, our communities, our churches, we can certainly feel pressure in a lot of different directions. So maybe, maybe you're feeling some of these burdens right now. Maybe, maybe there are financial burdens that you're experiencing because of, this, uh, because of COVID-19 that you weren't experiencing before. Maybe you've been laid off of your, your work, or maybe your hours have been cut. And maybe you're self-employed, and, and the work just isn't there the way that it was two or three months ago. And, and that's creating financial hardships for your family. Uh, financial burdens, those, those things, those are real. Maybe you're dealing with relational burdens. Maybe it's relationship between a, you and, and your spouse, or between you and your child, or you and a parent, you and a brother or a sister. Maybe you're dealing with health burdens. Uh, maybe, maybe you're getting older, and we all are. And as, as our bodies continue to age, we, we experience things that we haven't experienced before. And that becomes a concern. It becomes a, a financial concern as we deal with those health issues. Or maybe you're feeling the pressure of spiritual burdens. Maybe this time of being away from your church family, even though you can watch Bible teachings online or you can watch church services online, it's not the same as being in a room with your Sunday school class or being in a, in a sanctuary with, with other worshipers and lifting up your voice and, and, and hearing God's word preached and proclaimed. So as you, as you possibly are dealing with these burdens, are you carrying these burdens alone? Or do you have other people that are helping you, that are encouraging you and supporting you? So we recognize that we have freedom, that we are to have focus, that we are to correct, but also that we are to carry. And lastly, we are instructed to work. To work. Now we turn to Galatians 6, verse 10. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all men, and especially to those who are of the household of the faith. Galatians 6.10 So while Paul encourages the believers in Galatia to work for the good of all, he specified especially for those who belong to the household of faith. Relationships within the church are held at the highest level. Not only is this a means of provision within the church family, but it is also an incredible testimony to the world. As the non-believer looks at how we, as Christ followers, treat brothers and sisters within the family, within the church body, that should encourage and challenge them to consider their faith. Relationships inside the church are held at the highest level. Recognizing the importance of healthy relationships within the church, there is greater significance for us to demonstrate those traits that help us maintain healthy relationships. Love, encouragement, forgiveness, service. We see this in John chapter 13 as Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. John 13, verses 34 and 35. And so one way that we demonstrate that love is by being a part of a church. Being an active part of a church 
body, a local body of believers, is critical. It's essential to your spiritual growth. So consider this question. How do we grow in our service within that body, within that body of believers, within that church? How do we grow? I'm going to again encourage you to put me on pause. Consider that question. Discuss it if you're watching this video with someone else. And then come back and let me share a few thoughts. So how do we grow in our service within the body? First, I think we need to be encouraged to show up more frequently. You know, it's, it's very difficult for you to, to know how to serve if you're not aware of the needs. And to, to connect with others, you must begin by spending time with them. And so if, if your desire is to, to grow in your service through a local body, we'll begin by showing up frequently. Secondly, we need to resist the urge to sit back and soak it up. You know, in our country, we have a consumer mentality. And that is true even as we go to church. Many times we look at church for what it has to offer us. What am I getting from this? What does this church offer for my family, for my teenager, for my child, for my senior adult parent? We look at it from, what we're, from the perspective of what we're receiving rather than what we are able to give. But remember, you have a gift. You have a talent. You have a skill to offer. So open your unique package of spiritual gifts and consider how God wants you to use them in serving. Third thought is that we need to take the initiative to serve. Don't sit back and wait for someone else to suggest a service project or, or to recommend that you do something, but, but see a need and then meet that need. So show up more frequently. Resist the urge just to sit and soak, and then take the initiative to serve. So consider, if, if you're part of a Sunday school class or part of a small group ministry within a church, what opportunities does your small group have to work for the good of others? Think about some projects that you might take on as, as a class, as a group, because we recognize that, that serving with others is, it just makes the service that much easier and, and more enjoyable because we get that opportunity to fellowship as well as serve. So here are some examples. Providing meals or child sitting for a family with a newborn. Maybe, maybe you're part of a young adult Sunday school class and, and you have a couple in your class or a prospective couple that just have had a baby. Well, what a great opportunity for you to serve that family by arranging for meals to be delivered to their house, by arranging for child care for maybe their older children so that they can focus more on that newborn for even if it's just for two or three hours. So many ways that you can serve that young couple. Or maybe this scenario. Consider sending a care package to college students as they pre prepare for exams. If your church is like ours, we see our college students over Christmas break and during the summer, but, but most of the year they're, they're away from home. They're at college. And, and, and so don't forget them. Find ways to let them know that you're thinking about them, that you still care for them. And, and in some ways you can even provide a service for them. Perhaps uh, helping an elderly person with yard work or spring cleaning. Uh, you know, maybe... Uh, Maybe you have specific skills that, that you are able to share uh, with that person. Um, you know, maybe it's not something that has to be done every week, but, but they just need help getting that, that jump start on starting to take care of their lawn for the spring or the summer, or that spring cleaning that needs to be done inside. So as we think about the opportunities that we can take collectively 
to serve, those opportunities that I can take personally, individually to serve. We're reminded that uh, the service is important. Service is important. Seize the opportunity to serve. As, as I think about service, I, I, I think of uh, a lady who I, I just read her story. Her name was uh, Miss Malamo. Her actual name was Petra Malina Mo. But she went by Mala. She was born in September of 1863 in Norway. But as a young lady, approximately 21 years old in 1884, she moved to Chicago, Illinois. Uh, one day, uh, she went to church, and while she was at church, uh, the pastor was speaking about uh, serving and, and recognizing Mal there in the congregation. He knew that she had uh, given her heart to Christ uh, about a year and a half earlier. And so he asked the question, what are you doing for God? Why don't you do something for God? And as he looked at Mala, he, he stepped off the platform and went to her and, and made her stand up. And, and as he made those comments, what are you doing for God? Why don't you do something for God? He, he physically pushed her down the aisle of that church to try to make a point that as Christ followers, we have to get out of the comfort of our churches, out of, out of our pews, and take on that mentality, that desire, that attitude to serve others. Well, Mala took that challenge literally. And within the next few months, she decided to quit her job and to begin studying to be a missionary. A few years later, at the age of 29, she was commissioned and sent to Natal, South Africa. South Africa. She would spend the rest of her life on the mission field in Africa, and with other mission work as she was at home for furloughs. By 1950, Mala had been on the field at that time for 28 consecutive years without a furlough, and her health was beginning to deteriorate. She died in 1953 at the age of 90 years old. And she's, uh, this quote is attributed to Malamo. What are we here for? To have a good time with Christians or to save sinners? What are we here for? To have a good time with Christians or to save sinners? Well, we enjoy the fellowship of brothers and sisters in Christ, but we recognize that ultimately our goal is to be a Great Commission church, to go to make disciples. And that means we have to take that attitude of service wherever we are, in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our workplace, in our schoolhouses, in our communities, and in our churches. So seize the opportunity to serve. As you remember that you are to be free from sin, that you are to focus on others, that you are to connect with gentleness, that you are to carry others' burdens, and that you are to work for kingdom growth. Seize the opportunity to serve. Let me close with a word of prayer, and then uh, I'll invite you to stay after the prayer as I share a couple of announcements. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the way that your Son demonstrated service. Even in that final night, as he met with his disciples in that upper room, he took the water and the basin and the towel and he washed his disciples' feet. The act of the, low, the lowest servant in the house he assumed that responsibility because it was so important to him that he show his followers that they were to be servants. Lord, I pray that you would continue to teach us 
what that means and what that looks like in our homes, everywhere that we go, in our churches, in our community, and in our world, that we would serve others as we serve you. We thank you, Father, for loving us, for the precious blood of your Son. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, as I wrap up this Bible teaching, let me just remind you of a few things if you're here in the Cameron area. Uh, first of all, uh, this, this lesson that I've provided is, uh, again, part of our Sunday school curriculum for some of our classes here at First Baptist Church. And so one of the questions that, that's been asked is, well, when are we going to resume our regular Sunday school classes now that we're not on stay-at-home orders? Uh, we, we are looking to start classes again uh, the first Sunday in June. Uh, different classes may be meeting at, at other times other than on Sunday morning, but I think most of our classes will, will resume their Sunday morning studies. Uh, we will do all that we can to uh, set up the classrooms to maintain social distancing, and because of that, some classes may have to be moved into some other spaces to accommodate uh, the size of their classes. Uh, so we invite you to join, uh, join back with us. Uh, again, uh, first Sunday in June for Sunday school classes here at First Baptist. Uh, continue to check social media uh, and uh, the, the bulletin at church if you worship with us or, or Facebook or uh, website, uh, a newsletter if you're on our mailing list to see more details. Uh, also, a reminder to our men that if you are free on Tuesday mornings at 6 a.m., I'm continuing live uh, my teaching through the book of Ephesians. I had posted that online for a few weeks as we were not able to meet together, but now that's just being done uh, exclusively live on Tuesdays at 6 a.m. And we're in Ephesians chapter 5, now in uh, section where we're looking at verses 3 through 14. And then lastly, the worship services here at First Baptist Church. We, uh, we are approaching the weekend of May 5th. 17th. And uh, so this Sunday, May 17th, we will have two live worship services here at First Baptist, uh, a 930 service, which will be more of a traditional hymn style service, and then an 11 o'clock service, which will be our more contemporary blended service. That same service we recorded on Wednesday night. And so you also have the option, if you're not able uh, to join us for one of those live worship experiences, you can continue to watch the service as recorded on the Wednesday uh, before on that Sunday morning as well. Or if you would like to avoid the Sunday morning crowd and join us on Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock, uh, you can experience that contemporary blended service uh, only uh, on Wednesday night when we actually record that service. So it gives another option for coming to a live service, and it also allows us to continue to record and to make those services available uh, via our website. So, uh, again, we look forward to seeing you soon at First Baptist Church, whether that be for worship, whether that be through Bible study, but until then, I hope that you'll continue to utilize the resources that we place online. So I hope that you will have a great, great day and a great week, and I want to challenge you as you, as you walk this week, be looking for those opportunities to serve others, and then seize those opportunities to serve. Have a blessed week.